vicious. Yep. How about that? With the second pick in the 2011 NFL Draft, the Denver Broncos select Von Miller, linebacker, Texas A&M. He's the greatest ever, huh? And then I just wanted when you to got make- all the advantages. Welcome back to the Aggie War Pod, a product of the Republic of Football Podcast Network and Dave Campbell's Texas Football. I am Mike Craven, senior writer at Dave Campbell's Texas Football. And the other voice you'll hear on this podcast is my co-host, a barbecue eating machine who won't shy away from a road trip or any off-key rendition of Creed. The former fighting Texas Aggie defensive lineman arrived in College Station as a three-star product back in 2013. He now resides in Houston, but his heart never left. Ladies, gentlemen, and Reveille, I present the one and only Jay Arnold. Jay, how's it going? Man, it is good. That uh, that intro is still giving me chills like it did last week. So uh, you're, you're killing it on the introduction there, Mike. Got the intro down. Uh, Going to go with that one for a while. Uh, before we get started on, on the latest Aggie War Pod, uh, please go subscribe, rate, five star, share with your friends. We can only grow uh, if y'all help us. So please uh, uh, do that. The season should be a lot of fun. Uh, it's coming up. You know, only I think there's only two more free Saturdays before week zero where we get to watch at least some football. You know, three more weekends until you know the Aggies get going with their season. So you know, please buckle up. You know, listen to us. You know, uh, get us on social media. You can ask us questions. We can talk about anything. So I uh, appreciate the following so far. Uh, we're going to split this up into downs. We started this last week, and it kind of worked in, in a way to to keep the, the show flowing and organized. Uh, first down, second down, third down, fourth down. If you're listening to this podcast, you know how downs work. Uh, so we'll get into that. You know, this isn't specifically A&M related in first down, but we'd be remiss not to talk about conference realignment, RIP Pac-12. Uh, big news over this last week since we recorded this last pod. Oregon and Washington to the Big Ten, Arizona State, Arizona, Utah, following Colorado to the Big 12. The moniker Power Five is gone. There are no longer five power conferences. There's there's four. And we could probably argue if really there's only two. And so, Jay, uh, here on first down to get this going, just what were your initial thoughts as all this went down, you know, late Thursday night and then, you know, really kind of came to fruition on Friday? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's kind of a bummer, honestly. Uh, you know, Arizona State, Arizona, Utah, and Colorado, in a lot of ways, kind of feel like Big Twelve teams. Uh, so those, I'm not as kind of like surprised or shocked by. I mean, the Four Corners area, and then you look back all the way, go back to the Border Conference days where Texas Tech was a was a conference mate with Arizona State, Arizona. Uh, you know, there's something built in there and Arizona state and Arizona to me, at least always felt like they had more in common culturally with a lot of the Texas techs and, and uh, TCUs and, and big 12 schools uh, or schools from the old Southwest conference in general. Whereas, you know, Oregon and Washington, that kind of felt like more of the death knell to the old pac 12, obviously, it started with USC and UCLA leaving, but uh, once Oregon and Washington decided to leave, uh, I mean that's that's pretty much it, right? And the reason I say it's a bummer is because you have you have two rivalry contests that we don't know what the future of is going to be. Uh, I, I'm a big proponent of the regionality of college football being what made it so special. Uh, games like the Civil War between Oregon and Oregon State. The Apple Cup, Washington and Washington State. Those are games that I love tuning into. Uh, I think it was maybe 2016 uh, when Leach was still coaching at Washington State. There was like a, a very snowy Apple Cup game in Pullman. And it was on a Friday night, I think last week of the season. And I just like, it's fun football uh, that you get when you have those kind of rivalry matchups. And we're not going to get those matchups or, you know, maybe they'll try to preserve it somehow. They've probably put out some comments saying that they want to, but it's a bummer that those matchups are even in jeopardy, in my opinion. At its best, college football is a regional sport uh, where the champions of those regions can then go play the other champions of those regions, and then we crown a national title. I think in the ideal world, that's what we would have had, and and we had regional conferences forever, uh, but money changes stuff. And 
the idea that it, it's just now splintering and it's just now like, oh my gosh, how did we get here? Well, we got here in 1995 when the Southwest Conference split up. There's probably different generations back in the day that would that would isolate a point even before then, uh, where money started making the decisions uh, above you know the good of the athlete or the, even the good of the, of the fan. Uh, but to me, this was always the ultimate destination of this idea that the national champion is all that matters in college sports. And I, I believe there's plenty of blame to go around with that. I think fans pushed it with, you know, not wanting the BCS and needing a national champion. Cause remember until like 2003, we weren't really even claiming national titles in a real way. Like you weren't one verse two or anything of that nature until the BCS came around. Um, and so once we wanted more playoff games and we wanted more tournaments and we wanted to see who would win and we wanted more, of those helmet football games, it sent a message to the presidents and the athletic directors that that regional rivalry stuff doesn't matter. We don't want Oklahoma state versus Oklahoma. We want Oklahoma versus LSU. We don't want Texas versus Texas tech. We want Texas versus Georgia. Uh, We don't want Oregon versus Oregon state. We want Oregon versus Michigan. That was the message that has been sent by everybody. And then the money was able to win, win out. And it's an unfortunate thing on the bright side. I do think the big 12 is probably the best travel conference in the country as a sports reporter if i was to pick a conference that i wanted to follow and go around to all the big games one that just added boulder tempe salt lake provo cincinnati ucf you know all those places houston even you know fort worth that's a really cool conference i think it's going to be a really fun conference my worry is that it's a conference that doesn't matter because my my biggest worry about this whole deal is that the expanded playoff ditches ditches the six automatic qualifiers and worms its way into going, well, we'll just do the best 12. We'll get like a BCS-esque ranking out there that's computer uh, versus like a committee type group. We'll rank them one through 12 and the best will get in there and we'll end up with five SEC teams that have already played each other, five Big Ten teams that have already played each other and a couple other throw-ins and there'll just be a tournament of what we think in our echo chamber is the best teams in college football. And it's sad. It's just, it's a sad part. Uh, of the process that's happened here in college athletics. Yeah. Uh, and again, I mean, we've kind of been headed down this road for a while, like you mentioned with the breakup of the Southwest conference and you had, I mean, in the early 2010s, I think, or late two thousands, Texas, you know, there's the Longhorn network and, and the discussions with the PAC 12 and then Colorado leads for the PAC 12 and, Nebraska heads to the Big Ten, AM heads to the SEC, Missouri heads to the SEC. And, you know, since then, it's just been kind of one snowball effect after the other. And it goes all the way down, too. I mean, it's a ripple effect that's led to FCS conferences breaking up. I mean, you had the Big East, which was a really fun football conference in 2007. And the Big East football doesn't exist anymore. Uh, I mean, the closest thing we have to that is the American. And, I mean, it, it hasn't captured the magic of that 2007 season quite yet. Uh, And then you look down to the FCS level and, you know, some of the best teams at that level are are moving up to uh, moving up to FBS, right? Like James Madison was a a national champion. Uh, Appalachian state will always be known for being an FCS school that beat Michigan. Uh, Sam Houston state now has won an FCS title and moved up. I mean, there's all these programs that have bumped up and it can't help, but like, feels like a domino effect of realignment and you know i i know a lot of people probably don't watch as much fcs as i as i try to and i'm not even near the top of that but it's again it's it's kind of the death of all these regional rivalries and and regional conferences that i think made the sport so special yeah i mean this year we lose sam houston versus sfa which was like the sixth or seventh most played Texas on Texas college rivalry in the state, the most at the FCS level. So that we lose that with Sam moving up. And, you know, for a lot of those schools, that's about enrollment. Sam Houston's trying to grow into a 25,000 person university. And to do that, you need FBS football. And that's my worry, right? For an Oregon state, for Washington state, what happens to that student population? What even happens to those football teams? Um, Does Stanford just not have a football team in 10 years, right? Like does Cal, just go bankrupt and decide they're not going to do football or something, or do they join the ACC somehow or the American or what even happens with that kind of stuff. And so uh, we're, we're risking the fan base 
lessening at a local level and maybe growing at a national level where there's more and more just fans of college football. Like if you're 17 years old, you're just a fan of college football rather than the fan of your university or the one you went to. Cause I went to UTSA before there was football. So I kind of had a little bit of taste in that where you just kind of keep the fan that you already were like whatever you rooted growing up, you didn't have to exchange that rooting interest because you were at a team without football I think that's true even at smaller colleges where at Sam Houston, you probably see as many Aggie shirts as you do Sam Houston shirts. You know what I mean? And maybe that'll start to change uh, with Sam Houston playing FBS football. But yeah, it just uh, it seems like a, a bad time. You know, I also you know, the other point I wanted to make on this, I honestly feel like this is really just a referendum on how college football is viewed in, on the West Coast. Yeah. Um, they don't care about it. And, and the like the Southeast, you know, the Southeastern Conference and the Big Ten, I mean, they care about it maybe <laughs> at an uncomfortable level, right? Like maybe there's an in between there. Uh, but this sport has definitely like grown towards the rabid fan bases. And if you look at it, California, they're no longer like the number clear number or the clear number two or number three football producing recruit state in the country during COVID. They just kind of punted on football season. You could tell the Pac 12 as a whole for the most part was cool with just not playing college football for 2020 if everybody else was and kind of had to be, you know, drug around uh, on that whole thing. And so uh, to me, this almost feels like a whole region of of the United States getting left behind minus, you know, the, the USC, UCLA, Oregon, and Washington. And what does that do for the development of, of football out there as well? Yeah, I mean, it's – and the sad part is, too, I think, Washington State and Oregon State, their times with those fan bases still show up. I mean, what is what is college football game day without yeah. uh, Big Red, Big Crimson, right. the the flag that that made the journey so many times? And I mean, it, it's just a real bummer. And the the flip side of that too is, I hate it for the non revenue sports and and the athletes in those sports, right? Like now, I mean, let, fate, let, we face up to it. At football provides a lot of the money for some of the sports that are that are non-revenue producing uh but you also look at the conferences and and the sports where you're playing during the week and you're gonna be flying across two time zones uh to compete in in some of these conferences and i mean i don't know where washington state and and oregon state are going to end up right uh we'll we'll see how this kind of shakes out cal and stanford i mean i think they're a lot more in the camp that you know, they can take or leave athletics. Although Stanford, uh, with their all around athletics, you would think that they want to end up somewhere, right? Uh, Cal, I think, could take it or leave it, but it, it's, I don't know, it's just frustrating. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, we talk about Cal and Stanford, right? One of the greatest rivalry moments of all time. It's uh, true. The band on the field. Like, I realize that that's not where college football is anymore, but it's still the, the history and everything. Uh, behind it uh, just it just doesn't feel good and it's a lack of leadership this could all have been avoided right the mess with the portal could have been avoided with with more uh, leadership the mess with nil and its use in recruiting could have been avoided uh, with more leadership and so could this realignment had it been avoided uh, with more leadership maybe uh, not the whole thing but like the non-revenue sports as you talked about uh, with more leadership i imagine that they could have formed a football only super league, right? Like take the 30, 40 biggest college football teams that only care about the money and are going to make a bunch of money, put them in a super league and then keep all the non-revenue sports together. Like there's still a pac 12 for everything, but football, Uh, but in football, USC, the four, you know, USC, UCLA, Oregon, and Washington play in this separate football part of the equation, but the volleyball team, the basketball team, everything else stays the same within the league. You could have done that everywhere. Uh, But you know, and, and the NCAA wanted to wait until anything happened to it. It didn't want to change at all. It wanted to just kind of wait, wait, wait. And then all of a sudden it changed so fast and broke the whole apparatus. Um, probably a lesson to be learned there as a country uh, also. Uh, but like to have foresight and some leadership and just like really uh, be forward thinking in that way, I could have saved this whole deal. But that's asking way too much uh, when we're talking about the NCAA and college athletics at large. Um Let's move on to, to number two. Let's let's go to second down, get into some real Aggie talk. On Sunday, Texas A&M had a media day. And on that media day, uh, they took a team picture 
beforehand. Uh, that's always funny to watch, in my opinion, just watching the coaches pose and trying to get all these players to get into the same position and line up. I mean, it is hurting cats and it is hilarious to watch. You get a better appreciation for the coaches and the job they have to do uh, because of how hard it is to just wrangle a, a bunch of 20 year olds and get them organized and sitting for sitting still for that long. Um, and so I thought that was interesting, but then also, you know, not only usually we just get Jimbo Fisher and a couple players, and usually those players are Anaya Smith, Damani Richardson, other guys that have been programmed to not say anything of real interest. Media day was a little bit different media day. We got uh, DJ Durkin. We got uh, Bobby Petrino, most notably Elijah Robinson. Uh, I did uh, media, both quarterbacks uh, talked to the team. Noah Thomas, who Jay last week said, uh, was kind of going to be his breakout player of the year. I think that secret's out. I think people are buying that Noah Thomas stock uh, from from maybe maybe from the maybe it's your fault, Jay, or you know maybe <laughs> you're the one uh, driving up that stock. Uh, but I'll say this before I let Jay talk about what he took from the from the uh, interview. I remember the first press conference of the spring. I had in my head I was going to have Texas A and M at nine nine and three in the magazine. Then the first press conference of the spring happened and Jimbo kind of went back and forth on if Bobby was going to call plays. And he went on that whole thing about how scheme or uh, execution matters more than scheme because every offense is the same and they'll figure that out later. And they're not worried about the playbook. And and in my head, I remember going, oh, well, I think they're going to go eight and four. Like I'm going to take at least a win off because this thing is not on the tracks. They're not on the same page. Who knows how this is going to go? I walked out of Sunday's press conference because I also went down there for, for that one. I walked out of Sunday's press conference and go, oh, I think AM may go nine and three or 10 and two. It feels like they haven't figured out. There's some cohesion behind the scenes. Max Johnson and Connor Wegman talked about how Bobby Petrino has been the one in the quarterback room. They haven't seen as much of Jimbo this year. He's the one calling plays. As a head coach, as an offensive coordinator, and also philosophically, a lot of the things he believes and how he looks at the game and the way we did, like I said, we've known each other a long time. I mean, and studied each other's film a long time, uh, schemes, schematics, run game, bat, and he has balance. I mean, it's not just all throw, it's not it's all pass. It's a balanced attack that attacks and can use different weapons and has done it in times. He's had great tight end, he used it, he had great backs, very similar in philosophical uh, nature, and a very proven guy who has a great mind for the game and does a great job teaching and uh, getting great production. I mean, Petrino talked about calling plays. It just felt like – man, why couldn't we have done this in March? And so uh, for me, I, I feel like it answered a lot of the questions. It probably like gave a little bit less blood pressure, lowered the blood pressure maybe of the Aggie faithful. I walked out of Kyle Field in the media room feeling much better about the direction of the offense this year. What say you? Yeah, and maybe this is on me listening for things that I want to hear. Uh, but when I go back to the presser, and I listen to it a couple times to, to try to make sure I was hearing things correctly. Uh, Bobby Petrino talks a lot about tailoring his offenses to the guys that he has. It's exciting to to see the talent that we have and the and the weapons that we have. You know, a big part of offense is not the the playbook and the you know the the things that you like to run. Um, never really called a play because oh, I like this play. Let's call it and see how it works. Uh, you call plays for players. And we got to get all our weapons in the right spots. And the quarterbacks have to understand that, you know, it's our job to get them the ball in good spots where they can make plays for you. Uh, so learning that and going about that right now has been a lot of fun. But very talented receiver group, some big tight ends that are physical and can run and catch. Uh, like to see what our running backs are, are going to do and continue. They had a good spring and they continue to get better and better. And the competition gets more and more at that spot. So that makes everybody better. Uh, the offensive line with their experience from last year, you could see in spring they were starting to get it and get better each day in practice in spring. And and in early in these early practices, they've, they've continued to improve. And that is something that has probably been my biggest complaint uh, with Jimbo's offenses uh, dating back to 2018 when he arrived in, at, in College Station. So to hear that from Bobby Petrino, as well as the fact that he's been calling plays and, and been in the quarterback room uh, is extremely encouraging. Right. And, you know, he talks about tempo and, and finding advantages for the offense and how, you know, it's not necessarily going to be high tempo all the time, but that they're going to use variation and tempo to, to try to find holes in defenses and, 
just the adaptability from from what I've heard is something that I don't think this offense has had. It's an element that should improve it. And I mean, it makes me a little more excited too. I'm I'm like you where I heard the things that I was concerned about addressed uh, with Bobby Petrino speaking to the media. And and again, this could just be me wanting to hear those things, but uh, I do feel a little bit more confident in the, the offensive direction going into 2023. I think it's a lesson in PR because they, they could have let Petrino be available in March. They could let more players play. They could let more practices be seen by the public. Nothing. They had an open practice on Sunday afternoon where fans could go. Media could go. They did some 11 on 11 stuff. Nothing, nothing big got out, right? Like all the football guys know what football is. It's not like a reporter is going to report something about 12 for personnel that some real defensive coordinator is going to be like, Oh, I got you now. You know, like I figured that out. Like it, there, it feels deep deep state secrety for deep state secrety sake and you walked out of sunday going well shoot had everybody been available in march and we could have been able just to ask these questions and talk to bobby we would have just been done with this thing that would have saved six months of think pieces from everybody across the state myself included about like what's going to happen here are they going to come to blows is jimbo going to take away the play calling is jimbo in the quarterback room you know you you mentioned the 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 questions that, that were called to your attention about the relationship uh, between you and Jimbo and how it was going to work. Uh, I just wonder what was, you think, your reaction when you would read those articles? Were you amused? Were you angry? Or, you know, uh, uh, or, or when you would hear those reports, uh, did you have any reaction at all? I mean, you kind of like have a smile on your face and laugh about it because it's, it really is not how it works. It's, you know, like when, when I used to talk to our team when I was a head coach, I would explain the story that I work for an athletic director and I work for the president of the university. And it's my job to keep them happy. It's my job to make sure that they don't get mad at me. Um, and if I get mad at them, they don't really care, right? So that's the, you know, that's not how it's work. It's my job. I work for Coach Fisher. This is his program. I'm very, very impressed. Um, that's one of the reasons I came here is because of my knowledge of, of how he runs a program. Um, but it's it's my job to make sure I'm working hard every day. And uh, it's been fun, though. I can tell you that. It's been really enjoyable just because he's got such a great offense of mine. And with all the coaches, we've been able to sit in there and, and uh, strategize and see the things we want to do, build the offense. You know, it's we're building the, the offense for the for the Aggies this year. We got it answered in 30 minutes, 15 minutes with Petrino, 10 minutes with Max Johnson, 10 minutes with Connor Wegman. We're done. You know, everybody feels pretty good and on the same page. So I, I thought that was weird. I just, you know, I, I feel like Jimbo sometimes gets in his own way uh, when it comes to PR just because he doesn't like it. You know, it's like he's above it. And so he's just going to make it difficult because he can. And shoot, if I was owed $75 million, maybe I'd mess with some people too. Uh, but there seems to be easier ways to go about it. With, like you, the thing I was most intrigued by was this idea of FTS, the the feed the studs, right? And he kind of outlined all the studs he had and that he doesn't call plays because he likes a play or he thinks it looks good or you know he just wants to run it. He calls plays to get certain guys the ball in certain situations. And like you, that feels like the thing A&M hasn't done as much. The Jimbo may call plays because this is how it's supposed to be ran and we can run this one perfectly. And we're going to, you know, and, and, and with Petrino, it, it feels like there's maybe a little bit more room for the playmakers just to be playmakers. And when you're as talented as A&M is offensively, I think that could be the thing that really unlocks this group is the idea of you don't have to do it perfect, but just go do you. And that's going to score a lot of points. Yeah. And it's, I mean, there's still like the execution aspect of it and then, and knowing your assignment and everything, but it does feel like a lot less rigid of a system, uh, which I think will be conducive, especially in today's game. I mean, the game has just changed so much that, you know, having a little bit more flexibility in, in what you can do with the ball and, you know, the fact that, maybe you're not pressured to do everything step by step exactly the same way every time. It also adds a little bit of an air of unpredictability for defenses. I think it makes you harder to defend, but you know, talking about the FTS, the feed, the studs philosophy, 
I, I couldn't help but perk up whenever Noah Thomas was the first name he mentioned as far as the weapons. And uh, again, like you said, maybe the secret's out on my breakout player of the year. But uh, I just, again, excited about everything that Petrino said. I may have just been looking for clues, but uh, it, it just feels like uh, everything's trending in the right direction for AM to have a good year. Yeah, I mean, even Max Johnson and what he talked about, I thought was illuminating with the the 12 personnel and the 13 personnel and using more motion and getting the quarterback outside the box, just all, all the variations of stuff. Because I remember Jimbo in the spring talking about how they weren't going to do any scheme at all. You know, no scheme in the spring. We're just running on executing our stuff and, and being ourselves. And, and that seems to be a little bit false, right? You talk to the, the quarterbacks and the players and obviously uh, they were going through some new stuff, doing some new things. And it seemed like, the players were very excited about it. And, and to me, that that's a big deal, right? Like, are the players excited to play in this system? It, it felt a little rigid and just, frankly, not fun for a couple of years to play in that A. And, you know, Haynes King, in my opinion, was more worried about doing something wrong than he was worried about doing something right. And, and maybe Petrino unlocks that a little bit and goes, like, it doesn't have to be picture perfect. This is just the idea of how I want to do it. These are just the, the people I want to get the ball to. Y'all are the five-star athletes. Go figure it the F out, and we're going to outscore some people and stuff. And so, again, I I just, it, you know, I walked out of that, that spring press conference shaking my head, and I walked out of this one also shaking my head, but for op- opposite reasons. Uh, it just felt like a, a, a good press conference and one that, that should leave Aggie fans with some warm and fuzzies, right? It, 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 sh- it really should because – that's what you wanted to hear. And it's also like, why make coordinators available more, you know, because the head coach is worried about so many things that sometimes it's hard for them to talk about their individual rooms, uh, but the coordinators are only doing their individual rooms. So they talk about it in a clearer way. Sometimes I wish more coordinators were available. I know why they aren't. I get it, but I just wish, I wish more and more of them were how much prep you've been a football player before. How much prep goes into like the media stuff, like how, how rigid is that? Or are they just like, Hey Jay, you get some questions, go out there, try not to be an idiot. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my whole thing was I wanted to be kind of an idiot, but uh, <laughs> that's, now, brand. that's brand. It's on brand. Right. Uh, this is why I was ahead of my time and I should have been around for NIL, but uh, no, we, I mean, you do have like media classes that you have to take before you can give interviews. Right. Uh I mean, I, at least we did whenever uh, I was playing. I mean, AC, I think kind of – or that's Alan Cannon, uh, yeah. for those not in the know. Uh, they have like kind of a almost a curriculum, right, where you kind of have to be able to process a question, think through your answer, uh, and not say anything just kind of out of line. So it's, it's a process where there is some prep done. And, you know, on occasion, if there's like a specific situation, you're going to be briefed a little bit ahead of time uh, before you actually speak to the media. Any foot in the mouth moments for me? I don't think I had any foot in the mouth moments. Uh, I'm trying to think back on most of my foot in the mouth moments were post football. Uh, (laughs) It's okay to, it's okay to have them. Uh, you know, when you're not really representing the program, uh, I guess the, I mean, the closest thing to a uh, foot in the mouth moment was talking about my sack celebration against uh, SMU uh, when uh, Johnny Manziel had that Snickers commercial, uh, the Johnny Jam Boogie. And uh, I, I did that little thing as a sack celebration. I got a question about that and it, it was a little bit of an awkward moment, but I had some fun with it for sure. Basically, I had a bunch of guys from uh, Good Bull Hunting tell me I needed to do the little move Johnny did on his Snickers commercial, and I had to follow through on it. <laughs> is that a one time deal? Or is that- yeah, that's a one time deal. I can't do that again. Did you get in trouble for it? No, no, no. I've had a few foot in the mouth moments and in interviews, you know, you get in a press conference, you get the question, maybe the guy in front of you asked what you thought you were going to ask or a version of it. So now you're on the fly, just asking a question and it's getting filmed and you just feel like an idiot. I, I think it's funny. Like, yes. So on Sunday, I hope I'm not talking out of turn here, but you could tell Connor Wegman was a little bit nervous. You could, I've talked to Connor on his own when he was a recruit at Cypress Bridgeland. So I, I know how he talks and you could tell just in his voice 
that he was nervous to be up there talking. And I love the idea of it's it's more nerve wracking for a quarterback like a Connor Wegman, a, a you know a sophomore, basically a 19 year old kid taking questions and stuff on a Sunday in August. He's probably more comfortable getting chased down by a 300 pound lineman in front of 100,000 people on a Saturday in Kyle Field, and that always cracks me up because we're just a bunch of nerds asking dumb questions, and like those be- that's a real like in the fire moment. And I believe that Connor's probably more comfortable in those moments than he is at taking my question. Well, here's the here's the issue and the crux of it that you touch on is when you're getting chased by 300 pound linemen, you're just playing instinctual football. I mean, that's yeah. what you're trained to do. Uh, you guys, with some of your questions, can get a little bit uh, a little bit tricky. And you know, if if one thing uh, leads to another, and you say something wrong, I mean, you have to really stop and think about what you say every time. So it's it's a uh, it's a little less of an instinctual game in the in the media room. It's uh it's much more measured in your approach. So I think that's why some of the nerves pile up sometimes. I hate asking questions in press conferences, not because I'm shy, but because I hate to see articles written and it's like the question that I ask. You know what I mean? Like you give like a room full of reporters a really good answer that you ask with a decent question, and and now all the columns are about that thing. I try to try to save those, keep those in the chamber uh, to myself, and then do that to other reporters where I'm stealing. Uh, good answers uh, to write my columns and then keep my questions for when I get those guys one-on-one. That's my strategy. That's, that's uh, some quick journalism one-on-one with Mike Craven. I've always wondered about that approach uh, in the media room because I've sat through a couple of press conferences, both as an athlete and then a couple of times just uh, as a, uh, I mean, I I wouldn't really call myself a journalist, but as, as a member of the media, I guess. Media member. Yeah, sure. Yeah. The bar is uh, much lower than it used to be. So don't worry about it. You can be a journalist. Yeah, the that's fair. I'll, I'll go ahead. Big J, yeah, uh, J A Y journalist. There you go. Uh, so it, it's it's always interesting to hear that approach because I've wondered like if you're not keeping questions in the chamber or like if you ask something and you get a, a really good, well thought out response, but somebody kind of takes it out of context to use it as a headline. Like, do you just like look at that and you're like, damn you, can't yeah. believe you done that? A little bit, but like. Luckily, we're very anonymous and like nobody remembers who asked the question, really, unless you just say something really dumb or get into kind of a back and forth with a coach. And I'm just not that guy. Like, I'm not I'm not going to go back and forth with Jimbo Fisher in front of a bunch of people. Like, that's not my job, in my opinion. So I ask my questions and get out of there. I'm lucky to where they I do get the occasional one on one with players and because I'm not at everything every single day because I'm not a beat writer. But at A&M in Texas, you don't get that as much. And so you kind of have to un- unload your basket a little bit more there. Um, but everybody asked the the questions that were obvious on Sunday. So that, that I mean, we were all there to write the same column, right? We were all there to talk to Bobby Petrino, basically. And I think A&M accomplished everything that it could. We walked out of there, one, without any controversy. You know, nobody said anything crazy that became clickbait thing. And I think, honestly, I think most people in the media walked out of there feeling better about what they thought A&M was going to be uh, this year. So it felt like a, a, a good press conference for A&M, as good as a press conference can be, right? It's just a press conference. But yeah. one of the things I noticed to, to bring us into third down, we're going to talk about some position battles. Before we get there, Home Field Apparel, uh, a sponsorship uh, of the Aggie War Pod and the Republic of Football Network uh, at, in general. You can go there and order. If, you, if you're a first-time order, if you've never uh, ordered from Home Field Apparel, you can use the promo code WHOOP. W-H-O-O-P and get 15% off your first order. That UTEP collection uh, was as advertised. It was fantastic. As an honorary UTEP fan, I went ahead and grabbed one or two uh, of those items. So I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, For third down, we're going to talk position battles. Uh, Just to get this one out of the way, I thought it was interesting that Max Johnson and Connor Wegman spoke on Sunday during media day. You would think if that uh, competition was done and dusted completely. We would have just gotten one. Do you think there's a real quarterback competition or was this just kind of, Hey, both of you guys have sweated for the program. Thanks for not getting into the portal. You can both talk to the media. Uh, this is the first time where I felt like there actually is a real, uh, quarterback competition. Uh, I pretty much went the whole off season. Uh, and I mean, from the end of the last season on to now thinking that Wegman was the starter for sure. Uh, but with both of them speaking at media days, I mean, it just kind of feels like maybe there is some actual competition. I still think Wegman wins it and is likely the starter, but uh, I think this is the, the the first time that I really kind of questioned my thoughts as far as there being a battle and 
you know, just being coach speak with, with who the starter is going to be. I kind of feel like this is a nod to Max Johnson. Like, thanks for sticking it out with us. You probably could have transferred and gone, gone and been a guaranteed starter at, you know, a G5 school or, you know, a school that's lower on the totem pole um, than Texas A&M. It's hard for me to believe that Connor Wegman isn't the starter. He feels more of a fit for what Bobby Petrino tends to do anyway. The best quarterbacks Bobby Petrino's had in his career tend to play more like Wegman than like Johnson. Uh, it felt like a tip of your cap moment to like a senior leader and a guy who stuck around when maybe he didn't have to a, as a transfer, but it could be the other way, right? Like I, I'm not there. I, I'm not, I'm not in those meetings or whatever. Maybe it is a, a closer, closer battle before we move on to a different position. Would it lower your expectations for the season? If, if I tell you Max Johnson is the day one starter, is your win total prediction the same as if I tell you that Wegman is the day one starter? I think if Wegman's a day one starter, then my my prediction's a little bit higher. Uh, but I mean, who knows, right? If you know the, this offensive philosophy, maybe it doesn't really matter too much because you're gonna feed the studs either way. I just think that Wegman has more tools in the arsenal. Uh, I think the the added mobility is is a big factor there, and uh, the quick release that that. Bobby Petrino even talked about in his presser. I mean, Wegman, I think, has a much quicker release than Max Johnson. And, you know, all those factors make me lean towards if Wegman's a starter from day one, uh, the Aggies have a better year. I think nine and three, Wegman, eight and four, Johnson. Yeah, I I think I'm with you there. I think I I agree with you. The the upside is more with Wegman and you get him for multiple years, right? Like whatever he does and develops this year, that's a bonus for next year. Whereas if he's not the starter, he's behind Johnson. Not only if he stays, he's a year behind where he would have been if he starts this year. And most likely, honestly, in this day and age, he's, he's in the transfer portal if he's not starting this year uh, at some point. So it, it just feels like, you know, second year on campus, the way he played at the end of last year, the new offense coming in, uh, he's going to be the guy. Uh, but like you, I, I probably doubted it as much as I have all off season uh, that that was just kind of over with uh, as I did on Sunday. Another one that kind of surprised me, it seems like cornerback opposite of Tyreek Chappelle uh, is up for grabs. I think most of us just assume Tony Grimes, the, the transfer uh, from North Carolina was going to be that guy, according to reporters that I didn't stick around for the practice Sunday. There was like a five hour gap between the interviews and the practices. And it was uh, approximately 193 degrees in college station. And so I headed back to my air conditioning. Uh, but apparently uh, Josh DeBerry, the, the transfer from Boston College and then freshman uh, Javon Thomas were, were uh, competing for that job out there, rotating on, on ones with Grimes at the two. Uh, does that surprise you? And, and does it even really matter at this moment in time? It does surprise me, but not necessarily for the reasons that uh, people have talked about. Josh DeBerry from Boston College, I think that you know a lot of his best football was played at the nickel position as opposed to corner. Uh, but I mean, he did make all ACC as, as a corner, but I, I think I just in my head slaughtered him into the, the nickel spot instead of a corner spot. But I mean, he's a very talented individual, so it's not really a surprise to see him push for a starting position wherever he is, uh, with Grimes too. I, I just, I feel like Grimes, I don't know, even going back to his recruiting days, he always felt like more of a safety to me. I agree. Uh, so Grimes working with the twos and then possibly also getting some safety work in makes sense. Uh, I think the surprising aspect is that Javon Thomas is getting as much run time for me, at least. And I think that's a good sign. Obviously, you know, he comes in in spring. Uh, so that gives him a little, an extra semester to kind of adjust to the college, the college game, but seeing him push for playtime immediately, uh, I think is a good sign for the Aggies. Yeah. I mean, the more the merrier in the secondary Right. I mean, you you can't have too many guys that can cover guys in today's football. You're going to need four or five cornerbacks, dudes that can play multiple different spots. I like the idea of, of Grimes playing that star position when Bryce Anderson gets moved back deep next to Damani Richardson or, or something of that nature um, with different roles. And so, you know, right now feels like a time, especially for dudes that have been around since spring or even for a couple of years, you know, maybe rotate the, the positions and, and get some work in different spots. You come up with your starting lineup by then. When when do you think that coaches like to have like their starting eleven, or is the idea of starting eleven outside of the quarterback position something that's like overblown in the media and with fan bases more so than it is maybe in the rooms? 
I think the starting 11 outside of quarterback and like probably the, uh, the specialist positions is, is pretty overblown. Uh, honestly, I think it depends on your, your game plan. Right. And like, especially offensively, you're going to have different formations and different personnel groupings. So your starting 11 is going to change by, by nature of that anyway. But you also have where, you know, it's, maybe there's a matchup you like uh, a different guy. Hmm. Uh, you know, at a and I go back to the 2012 game uh, at Alabama where Spencer Neely is is playing against the, the center at nose because they like that matchup going into the week of. Uh, sometimes things just change. Uh, and it, it, it can be uh, a factor in – either the personnel groupings or uh, just, you know, a guy has a good week at practice, you know, and I do think there are like some positions where you have guys like you're probably not going to take them off the field. Walter Nolan, McKinley Jackson, those guys probably are going to be, you know, starting no matter what. Uh, but for the most part, I think they can be a lot more flexible than it used to be in the past. Yeah, it does feel like a thing we're always asking coaches about, and they're constantly like, guys, I don't – none of this matters to me. Like, they're going to yeah. play 40 snaps each, and and really the snaps in the fourth quarter probably matter more than the snaps in the first quarter. But we're just trained to, to care about who starts. You know, it's, it's just like a thing that we're used to, to caring about. We feel like it provides a pecking order and who's who's playing where and what combinations. We all want to be GMs and, and coordinators and, and coaches and stuff, so I think it allows us – uh, to do that more and more. I think offensive line is probably one where it also matters a little bit more, um, especially just certain positions, kind of like who's starting where, uh, who's who's playing well. Um, on that point, do you think that starting five up front is the the five that we think it's going to be? Uh, or do you think that there's a surprise or two or a position battle or two still up in the air? Well, let's uh, let's talk to the five that we think it's going to be and make okay. sure we're on the same page. Uh, so Trey Zoon at left tackle, Cam Dubery left guard, Bryce Foster center, uh, Layden Robinson right guard, and Ruben Fothery at, at right tackle. Yes, sir. All right. So we're in agreement on that. Uh, I think it's pretty settled, uh, but you're going to have injuries. So you, you look at who's behind those guys, it's a little less unsettled. Uh, I think you have like a guy like Martin Abu that has worked just about the entire interior as far as left guard center and right guard, uh, who's probably going to be first man up if somebody goes down on the interior. Uh, Ruben Fathery hasn't been 100% either, yeah. right? Like he's getting kind of eased back into the rotation. And and from all the reports that I've heard, Chase Pisantas is uh, pretty impressive for a true freshman. Obviously he has the spring semester under his belt too, but a true freshman on the offensive line, he's impressed a lot of people. Uh, with that being said, I, I'm pretty confident in what the starting five is. Uh, should everyone be healthy? Who's the guy that can't be out? Man, I I think Bryce Foster. And I did too. That's that's scary because he's been injured, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, he hasn't been healthy. Uh, but you know, you lose Wyckoff in the in the transfer portal, who was your your center when when Foster was down last year, and you know, I think. Uh, you have Naboo and, and also Remy and Strickland who've, who've worked to back up Foster. But, man, I, I just feel so much more confident in this offensive line if Foster's playing center and healthy. Yeah, it feels like a potential strength if he's healthy and playing, you know, at least like 10 of the 13 games, 10 of the 12 games. Um, it gets weird when he's not in there. Like, it's just a different unit. Like, you can watch last year and when he's in there and he's playing well and he feels healthy, you know, they're moving the ball. They're You know, he, he makes everybody around him better. I guess that's what a good center does. Um, so he does feel like the guy that that unit can't miss. And then lastly, before we move on, and we talked about we, we needed to discuss running backs a little bit more. Um, this is probably another position where the first guy out probably doesn't matter. You know, who who cares who who takes the first snap? It's who's going to get the most carries. But like, let's say by the Alabama game, who do you think is getting the most touches out of those three? Man, and I like all three of these running backs, and they all bring a little bit different to the table. Uh, Amari Daniels is obviously very explosive. Uh, Le'Veon Moss is a little bit bigger guy. And then Ruben Owens is a guy that can do it all. And, again, from everything that I've seen from practice and and heard, uh, Owens is also a fantastic uh, ball catcher out of the backfield, which I think could give him a little bit of an X factor in this. 
I'm really excited about Ruben Owens and his potential, and I think everyone else is too. I would not be surprised, even though he's a true freshman, if he's getting the most snaps come Alabama. I mean, that's my vote as well. I just think he's too dynamic, you know, and, and if we really are going FTS feed the, the studs here in College Station, then Ruben Owens is one of those studs. And I'd like to list the five guys that could potentially be on the field for a play, just to give Aggie fans an idea of what this offense can be. You got Ruben, Ruben Owens at running back, you know, not bad, you know, arguably one or two best running back in, in the country last year. Just incredible at El Campo, the black unicorn enough said there. If he lives up to potential, like watch out, this offense is going to be really good because they can surround him with Evan Stewart, Noah Thomas, Anaya Smith, Donovan green. I, I guess we could do Moose Muhammad instead of Donovan green. Like it is an embarrassment of riches on the outside at Texas A&M. We talk about the defensive line a lot. But that skill position room is pretty awesome. And if they figure out offensive line, if they figure out quarterback, uh, this could be one of the best offenses in the SEC, like simple as that. Yeah, I mean, like you said, it's it's frightening. And, I mean, you could also go to a two tight end set and get Jake Johnson involved. I mean, mm-hmm. you could – there's so many different things that you could do here. Uh, and, I, I, again, I don't want to discount Amari Daniels or Le'Veon Moss either because I feel like they're both incredible playmakers in their own rights too. Uh, Le'Veon Moss with his strength – and then Amari Daniels is, is extremely fast, right? Like he's not Devon A. Chain speed. Nobody is. But he's a guy that has the potential to, to really affect uh, a defense with, with the pure speed that he has. Uh, and, I mean, we haven't even gotten into some of the new weapons that have gotten on campus other than Ruben Owens. I mean, there's some other guys, too, that were picked up in the transfer portal. A guy like Jordan Anthony from Kentucky that's extremely fast. Uh you have the the six four receiver from from Grand Valley State. You know, obviously that's it's a little bit different uh, coming from D two to to Division one football, but still six four at, at that big of a target, right? Like if Jaday Walker, you know, turns out to be good, who knows? Uh, but it just feels like there's so many weapons at the top that uh, it, it's hard not to get excited about the potential combinations that you bring on the field. Uh, The guys at the Brian Eagle uh, were gracious enough to kind of like allow me to do their questionnaire that they do for the SEC kind of like lead in each year. And, um, you know, one of the questions was like, how do you think the Petrino Fisher relationship is going to work? And, and, and as I got down towards the end of my answer, I put, honestly, I think they're both big boys and they're going to figure this thing out and do the best that they can uh, together. My biggest worry is, is more about the defense. Are you at a point where like, you almost think the offense is going to be going to be fine. And we're really, we're just, it's about if A&M can stop the run and get after the passer. Uh, that to me feels like the biggest equation uh, that we don't know yet. Yeah. Uh, I, again, I, I worry still a little bit about the offensive line just because of the health issues that they've had in the past. I think that's still my number one concern, but there is some truth to the fact that the defensive line uh needs to improve against the run. I just, man, it's so hard for me to not feel confident in in McKaylee Jackson and Walter Nolan up front, uh, especially against the run and, you know, rushing the back. I just, and I know that they haven't done it yet, but there's just so much potential in that defensive line unit that I've, I guess, talked myself into the fact that I don't think it'll be an issue uh, in spite of the fact that linebacker is still worrisome. Right, because you're going to need those guys to fit and make plays off the defensive line, even if your defensive line is perfect at executing and, and filling gaps. I mean, it sounds to me like Jay Arnold's ready to go 10 wins, that he's ready to be 10 win Jay <laughs> and, and pick 10 and 2 if that offensive line uh, can stay healthy. And I'm with you, right? If we if we flash forward uh, to Thanksgiving weekend going into LSU, and you tell me if, if AM can go into Baton Rouge, they win that game, they're going to have a tiebreaker and go win the West. Like, I, I can see it, you know? Yeah. Uh, I think, unfortunately, I think the 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 part that should worry A and M fans is that I you also could probably feel the same way about seven and five and six and six. You know, yeah. like if we're being honest, you know, and so um, that's the that's the part. Uh, but when we start talking about this, when we start doing this podcast, it's like, man, it can be it can be really good. Like, where are the holes? And then the holes are more about staying healthy and, and taking a a step forward that I think we believe that you know all these super talented guys have the ability to do so. Um, lastly, on fourth down, before we get out of here. Coach's poll came out. Uh, talk about a dinosaur that no longer really matters that much, but it's August 7th. So it gives us 
uh, something to talk about. I'm always curious about how many coaches. I think coaches do fill out the preseason poll, and I think that's probably the last one. Most of them fill out until like the very end of the year. That's really should be called the SID uh, poll on, on a weekly basis because coaches have way too much to really care about what's going on around them. Uh, there are, by my count, six SEC teams in the top 25, uh, four in the top 10. I believe eight or nine of the top 10 is the SEC and the Big Ten to just kind of give everybody an idea of where we're moving towards this. Uh, four teams ranked in the state of Texas. Uh, Texas is at 12. TCU at 16, Texas Tech at 24, and then the Fighting Texas Aggies at 25. Jay, would you have rather them just be left off, or is 25 uh, a good spot for 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 A and M? I mean, I always think the added chip on the shoulder is good for a program. Like, I think A and M would, I would have probably preferred for them to be left off, just so they had that added little bit of motivation. But 25 isn't too high. I think uh, that's reasonable. Uh, based on the expectations going into this year. Uh, and, you know, there's a there's a big chance to, to really leap up the rankings in a hurry, uh, as there always is in the SEC. So we'll see what happens. But, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see for sure. I was kind of surprised, honestly, that Texas was only at 12. Uh, I also think that uh, UTSA is a team that could easily find their way into the top 25 in a hurry. Yeah, I mean, I think on paper, UTSA deserves to be ranked more than Texas A&M does just from what they've accomplished the last two years. I honestly think Alabama, Ohio State, Georgia, and Michigan are the only four programs that have won more games than the Roadrunners since uh, the start of 2021. Uh, Two-time defending conference champ, all that kind of stuff. It feels like starting them uh, ranked would have been the right thing to do. Uh, but A&M was, was going to get into the top two. If they meet uh, Miami in week two, A&M is going to be 5-0 and oh going into the Alabama game. They're going to be like 10th in the nation or something like that. So I also understand uh, why voters put them on there. So uh, I could go back and forth, but I'm with you. I think as a team, if you're going to be 25th, you might as well just be unranked and be able to play that that card. Um, not that any of this stuff matters, right? Not that Miami prepares differently if A&M is 25th or if not, but um, – yeah, I, I just thought after the last two seasons, I didn't I didn't expect to see A and M ranked there. I was surprised to see them ranked in the preseason poll. Yeah, I mean, five and seven, it's it's a little bit surprising, but again, it, talent. It's, it speaks yeah. to the talent. Like A and M starting to get the old school Texas treatment that A and M fans used to always complain about. That like no matter what, Texas is ranked just because they recruit well. And I think A and M, since they recruit so well now, A and M is also and they play in the SEC. It's like, man, they're super talented. How can I leave them out? I'm not going to be the yeah. guy that didn't put them in the poll and then they finish sixth in the nation or something. Yeah, and it's also uh, it's also interesting to see Wisconsin at 21, just with all the turnover they had in the year they had last year. Uh, a new coach coming in. I know I'm getting kind of off into the weeds here looking at the coaches' poll, but uh, it, it's always fun. I mean, there's only so much to talk about, right, until we actually get games played. So got to – it's just intriguing to me to see Wisconsin up there in the top 25. What's always surprised me about the coaching poll is it reveals how little the coaches know about the football around the country, you know, and maybe they should not because they're just so hyper-focused. And I imagine they know a lot about their conference mates and the teams that they're going to play uh, and out of conference. Uh, but TCU doesn't care about Ole Miss. Like Sonny Dykes isn't paying attention to what's happening at Ole Miss. And Lane Kiffin's not paying attention to what happens at Wisconsin. They're just like, look, Luke Fickle's a good coach. Let's rank him. You know, like that's yeah. that's all that is or whatever. Uh, Although like, I will I, say Tanner Mordecai up there could be pretty interesting. Yeah. I, here's my Tanner Mordecai. Tanner Mordecai. Yeah, I, I agree with that. The Tanner Mordecai thing. He couldn't start at SMU this year. Right. Like he didn't. He left because Preston Stone's probably the better quarterback and the guy that SMU is going to go with. Uh, I have my doubts about Wisconsin. I will be very surprised. I also the Phil Longo thing. Like I, I will be very surprised if Wisconsin. It is going to be weird. <laughs> this is an Aggie podcast, so we're going to just kind of like go off topic here in the last five minutes. It's going to be. There may not be a weirder uh, illusion to your eyes that you're going to see this year than Wisconsin running the air raid. It is going to be something to see for sure. Do you have any takes on Phil Longo? Uh, I don't don't have strong takes. I think mostly because I focus on the defensive side of the ball and and defensive play callers more than the offensive side of the ball. Uh, Most of my Phil Longo knowledge is second hand. And a lot of it in, in a weird way is come from Ole Miss fans just talking about how they weren't the biggest fans of his offense when he was there. 
Uh, but I mean, who knows, right? It's it'll be interesting to see. Is there is there a particular Phil Longo take that you were looking for there? No, I just don't buy it. I'm just not a Phil Longo guy. <laughs> um, and so I just don't get why he keeps getting all these excellent jobs. Like he's just one of the, he just like, he must be really fun to play golf with. You know, that's how I always think about those kind of guys that you're like, how does it, how do they keep being, they never have to take a step back and just be like a quarterback coach again or, or whatever. They're just like OC at all these different power five programs. How does that happen? It's like his agent must really be connected and uh, it must be really fun to play golf with. Cause I, there's plenty of young coaches that can go do what Phil Longo can do for less of the price and doesn't have a track record of calling the same play 13 times in a row or whatever it is that Longo enjoys doing. So that's my Phil Longo take. I don't buy it. I think Wisconsin's going to be good. It's just not going to be this year. I, that's my. That's also my Nebraska take. Uh, I think Nebraska is going to be good. I just don't think it's going to be this year. So that's where I'm at. Yeah, that's a fair take. And you know, obviously, when the divisions go away, that'll be you know, a, a bit of a change because uh, I'm going to miss the Big Ten West just kind of being uh, a mess of parody and, and enjoyable football for sickos like me. But uh, yeah, it'll, uh, <laughs> I do, I'm just laughing at the fact that we got so into the weeds on Wisconsin football. <laughs> I, I, I was going to ask you before we get out of here, because like I, I think, I mean, not that I played offensive side of football, I just think as a guy that like can watch football, the offense is easier to get into, right, than the defense. So, like, do you have some coordinators out there, like a coordinator on the top of your head that you just think is like, like you don't get it? You know what I mean? Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, who is your Phil Longo? Uh, from a defensive perspective, I mean, it was probably Kevin Steele for a while. There, there you go. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's a good one. Yeah, like guys like that always fascinate me. It's like it's like. I want to be in one of those groups. Maybe I am in one of those industries where like, once you've kind of like made it, you made it. Yeah. And that's kind of how coaching feels. Like once you've kind of like made it into that realm, you just are always in that realm. And and like guys like that, I just don't understand how they keep getting job after job after job. I mean, I do, I, I do get it, but I wish it wasn't true. Yeah. Pays to be uh, anyway, I'm going to, I'll stop yeah. there. All right. <laughs> Aggie Warpod, Jay Arnold, uh, Mike Craven. Next week, Jay is going to be on vacation. I am also jealous. He will not. He's going to escape the 1,000-degree heat and humidity of Houston, Texas, and get out of here. We are going to record a SEC preview on Friday to release for next week. We'll buy and sell some teams. We'll talk about who we think is going to win, who we think is going to underachieve, overachieve, all that kind of stuff. So it'll be a big SEC preview next week. Uh, We look forward to recording that. Uh, For Jay Arnold, for Mike Craven, Dave Campbell's Texas football. Uh, and we're also going to put this up on YouTube, I believe. I think this is going to be first. I mean, you're watching it. Uh, you're already in there if you, if you think so. But if you're listening to it still at this moment, uh, we're going to start trying to do some video stuff. So you're going to start seeing us more on social media in that way as well. So uh, we will talk to you all next week. The, the amount of evaluation and time when you're successful, it's just as extensive when it's not successful. I mean, it really is. The amount of time does not change. The amount of speculation, the amount of questioning, the amount of is there a better way to do it? Is somebody else doing it better? Or are we doing it the right way? How we teach it? I mean, you. I mean, I, people act like that is a very intricate and long-standing thing that goes on for whole oh, offseason, six, seven months at a time, all the time. Mm-hmm.